post-1945 world live for 45 years in fear of another global conflict, this time primarily fought with nuclear weapons. It never took place, but many other conflicts have occurred. In the immediate aftermath of the Second World War, there was a renewed clamor for independence in those Third World territories which were part of Western colonial empires. This was especially so in South and Southeast Asia. In India, long considered the jewel in the British imperial crown, agitation for independence had begun as early as the 1920s and had continued throughout the Second World War. Even so, Indian soldiers, sailors and airmen fought bravely and loyally on the British side in the North African desert, the mountains of Italy and the jungles of Malaya and Burma. Some captured in North Africa and Malaya were, however, suborned by the Germans and Japanese to join the Indian National Army, whose overall leader was Chandra Bose, seen here wearing spectacles. Led by Pandit Nehru and his Indian Congress Party, agitation for independence increased after the war against Japan ended in September 1945. In March 1946, the British government, which had already accepted that India must have her independence, sent out a commission to investigate how best this could be achieved. What soon became clear was that the two main religious groupings, the Muslims and Hindus, were at odds with one another. Indeed, that summer there were violent clashes between the two, especially in Calcutta. The death toll from these clashes rose alarmingly. The British, exhausted after six years of war, decided that independence must be accelerated. In February 1947, Viscount Mountbatten, who had been Supreme Allied Commander in Southeast Asia during 1943-45, was sent out to India as Viceroy, with the mission of achieving independence in six months. It was agreed that two states should be formed. Pakistan would be made up of two predominantly Muslim regions in the north, albeit separated by hundreds of miles. India would represent the remainder of the subcontinent. When this was announced, there was a stampede by Muslims and Hindus to get to the right side of the future new borders. Tension was high and there were several horrific massacres, which the British were largely powerless to prevent. Eventually though, on the 15th of August 1947, India and Pakistan were granted their independence, and the British left after a stay of 250 years. Relations between the two countries were, however, bad from the start, especially over the disputed province of Kashmir, whose Maharaja dithered over which country to join. He was forced to ask India for help after the Pakistanis tried to annex Kashmir. A full-blown war broke out, which only ended after the United Nations had arranged a truce in January 1949. British forces liberated Malaya from the Japanese in September 1945. Here too, there was a demand for independence, but it came from among the Chinese inhabitants, who resented having inferior status to the majority Malays. Chinese communists planned to turn the country into a Marxist-Leninist state. They began a campaign of intimidation of workers on the rubber plantations and in the mines and factories. Acts of sabotage followed, and in June 1948, operating from jungle bases, they began to kill British planters. The terrorists' aim was to secure the rural areas. They would then move into the towns and create such a breakdown of law and order that they could seize power. Late in 1951, General Sir Gerald Templer was appointed British High Commissioner after his predecessor had been killed in a terrorist ambush. 
It had, however, already been recognized that the terrorists enjoyed significant material support from the villagers on the jungle fringes. The water in which the terrorist fish swam, as Mao Zedong put it. A project had therefore been got underway to rehouse these people in new protected villages away from the jungle. Templer recognized, though, that the war against the terrorists could never be won without the support of the people. He therefore encouraged what was called a hearts and minds policy, designed to improve the quality of life. Operations against the terrorists were not just the prerogative of the armed forces. The police and civil government were also closely involved. Yet victory over the terrorists was not going to be achieved overnight. By 1954, there were no less than 45,000 troops in Malaya, twice what there had been in 1948, together with police and local forces. Australian and New Zealand troops also took part. Air power played a significant role, with helicopters being used for reconnaissance and to support the patrols in the jungle. Supplies were dropped by parachute in more inaccessible areas. Aircraft too were used to attack suspected terrorist camps. Sometimes they were armed with rockets, like these Spitfires. But in spite of the continuing emergency, Malaysia gained its independence on the 31st of August 1957. Merdeka, or Freedom Day. But still the emergency continued, with the terrorists being driven ever deeper into the jungle. It did not officially end until the 31st of July 1960, by which time the surviving terrorists had crossed Malaysia's northern border into Thailand. It had been a long and grueling campaign, but was to be held up as an example of how insurgency could be defeated. This was in contrast to Indochina, where the French, determined to cling on, were eventually defeated by the Viet Minh, who employed the same tactics that the communists had used in Malaya. The Dutch East Indies was another example of victory for nationalism. The Dutch, like the French in Indochina, were in no position in September 1945 to immediately reclaim their Southeast Asian territories. The British had to liberate the Dutch East Indies, but did not arrive until the end of September 1945. As in Indochina, indigenous elements, led by Dr. Ahmed Sukarno, who had headed a puppet regime under the Japanese, immediately declared independence on Japan's surrender. Thus, the British not only had to disarm the Japanese, but also cope with nationalist violence until the Dutch returned. Dutch forces began to arrive in October 1945, and they and the British were quickly enmeshed in a protracted anti-guerrilla campaign against the nationalists. The British forces finally left in the autumn of 1946. That November, the Dutch and Indonesians reached agreement that Java, Sumatra and Madura would be given to the latter, and that the remainder of the Dutch East Indies would also eventually be ceded. During 1947, there were numerous ceasefire violations, and in July, the Dutch launched a police operation and reoccupied much of Java. The United Nations managed to broker another ceasefire in January 1948, but this too proved precarious, and in December, the Dutch launched another police action, occupying the whole of the existing Indonesian Republic. Not until the end of 1949 did Indonesia finally achieve full independence under Dr. Sukarno. The struggle had cost 25,000 Dutch and some 80,000 Indonesian casualties. 
The clamour for self-determination also much altered the map of Africa. In 1945, only Ethiopia, formerly Abyssinia, and Liberia enjoyed full independence. Less than 40 years later, the whole continent was independent. In the case of former British territories, the transfer of power was generally peaceful. There were, however, exceptions. In Kenya, an organization called Mau Mau began to attack white farms in the highlands and terrorize blacks loyal to the British. A state of emergency was declared in October 1952, and British reinforcements were sent in. The operations became concentrated on the heavily wooded Aberdare Mountains, where the Mau Mau had its bases. The British conducted massive sweeps of the forests. Many suspected Mau Mau members were imprisoned. Not until 1960 was the emergency finally lifted. Kenya finally gained its independence in 1963 under Jomo Kenyatta, whom the British had interned as a suspected Mau Mau leader. In contrast, the Portuguese resisted demands for independence and, as a result, found themselves engaged in long and exhausting counter-insurgency campaigns in their territories of Angola, Portuguese Guinea and here in Mozambique. Indeed, it was not until there was a military coup in Portugal in April 1974 that the country finally began to relinquish its grasp and the colonies gained their independence. King Baudouin granted independence to the Belgian Congo in June 1960. Civil war immediately erupted, forcing many whites to flee the country. The most fiercely fought campaign in Africa was, however, that in Algeria. The country had been an integral part of metropolitan France since 1848 and was heavily settled by Frenchmen, who were known as Les Pieds Noirs, the Blackfeet. As early as May 1945, on VE Day, Muslim extremists rose and killed over a hundred Europeans. In revenge, 50 times this number were killed by the French army and the Pieds Noirs. In 1954, the Front de la Libération Nationale, or FLN, the militant Arab nationalist movement, began to attack the Pieds Noirs, beginning in the remote Ores Mountains in the southeast of the country. The French army moved in, and soon there was a full-scale war. Successive French governments tried to find a way out, but the positions of the FLN and Pieds Noirs grew ever more apart, as atrocity was met by counter-atrocity. By early 1956, the French military strength in Algeria had reached half a million men. Supported by aircraft, the army launched an offensive against the FLN. The FLN suffered some 14,000 deaths by the end of the year. Yet they were by no means vanquished. On the contrary, their strength continued to grow. The French also launched a hearts and minds campaign as the British were carrying out in Malaya. But this campaign was partially negated by a policy of moving people from their villages in active FLN areas to bleak, tented camps close to French army barracks. From mid-1956, an especially vicious war developed in Algiers, the capital. FLN bomb attacks on French civilians met with reprisals in kind. 
In January 1957, the FLN organized a general strike in Algiers, but this was broken by the army and the city was quiet for a time. In May, however, two French paratroopers were shot leaving a cinema. The paras immediately retaliated, killing some 80 Muslims in a Turkish bath. The FLN bombing campaign resumed and once more the Pied Noir took the law into their own hands. The French paras, largely ignoring the atrocities committed by the colonists, tracked down the FLN leaders in Algiers and restored order. The French were enjoying military success against the FLN in both urban and rural areas. Yet the FLN had by now a firm external base from which to operate. France's other northwest African territories of Morocco and Tunisia had gained their independence in March 1956, since they were colonies as opposed to being part of France. It was to Tunisia that many FLN groups fled in the face of the French offensives of 1956. In order to prevent them infiltrating back into Algeria, the French now constructed the Maurice Line, an electric fence along the 500-mile Algerian-Tunisian border. The FLN still managed to get back into Algeria and carried out a number of ambushes. Incensed with the support that Tunisia appeared to be giving to the FLN, especially after two French aircraft were shot down by machine gun fire from the Tunisian border village of Sakiet, other French aircraft bombed it in February 1958. Eighty people were killed. There was an immediate outcry from left-wing elements in France and from the rest of the world, which was already growing concerned over the use of torture against FLN suspects. The French government was forced to apologize to Tunisia, but this added to growing right-wing resentment that it was not being tough enough over Algeria. Both in France and Algeria, they looked to France's wartime saviour, Charles de Gaulle, to resolve the issue. And the agitation increased, especially in Algiers, where government buildings were stormed. Finally, on the 1st of June 1958, the French president summoned de Gaulle to take over the reins of government. Three days later, de Gaulle was in Algiers, where he received an ecstatic welcome. Support for him increased even more when he declared that all who lived in Algeria were French. Et je déclare qu'à partir d'aujourd'hui, la France considère que dans toute l'Algérie, il n'y a qu'une seule catégorie d'habitants. Encouraged by this, Algerians, both Pieds Noir and Muslims, gave de Gaulle massive support in a referendum held at the end of September. He, however, was privately convinced that peace must be made and a Muslim government be allowed to come to power. In order to woo the Muslims, de Gaulle announced an ambitious development program designed to improve their lot. He also offered to release thousands of FLN prisoners and commute death sentences. The FLN, however, rejected the offer of peace talks, seeing it as tantamount to a surrender demand. The nationalists had also by now initiated a terrorist campaign in France itself. Pierre Noir hardliners, on the other hand, interpreted the offer to mean that de Gaulle was about to betray them. De Gaulle, however, quietly removed extremist senior officers 
and appointed Air Force General Maurice Schau to command in Algeria, with orders to crush armed resistance so that peace negotiations might be made possible. Schau created a mobile reserve of some two divisions and carried out strikes on each region of Algeria in turn. The hallmark of his operations was the development of the air mobile concept, troops rapidly deployed by helicopter and supported by ground attack aircraft. So successful was this that all of Algeria, apart from the Ores Mountains, had been pacified by the end of 1959. Other nations took note and air mobility was to become a cornerstone of American operations in Vietnam and was to play a key part in the 1991 Gulf War. In September 1959, however, de Gaulle revealed his true intention, the government of Algeria by the Algerians. The Pieds Noirs protested and elements of the army also turned against de Gaulle. The climax came in January 1960 when the Pieds Noirs threw up barricades in Algiers. Feelings were running high. Only heavy rain diffused the situation with its awesome prospect that Frenchmen might be forced to fire on Frenchmen. Even so, massive troop reinforcements had to be deployed to the Algerian capital and the atmosphere remained volatile. All this had meant a cessation of offensive operations against the FLN in the countryside. Indeed, it was not until July 1960 that they were resumed in the Ores Mountains. Talks with the Muslim government in exile had opened, but were soon deadlocked. At the same time, there was a sharp increase in urban terrorist activity, especially in Algiers. The Pieds Noirs complained that they were not being given adequate protection and now began to plot with disillusioned elements in the army in Algeria to topple de Gaulle. Algiers itself was now reduced to virtual anarchy, with the Pieds Noirs attacking army and police. The Muslim mob took advantage of this and Pieds Noirs, army and police now turned against it. De Gaulle, realizing that a solution based on moderation on both sides was no longer possible, held another referendum, which produced a 75% vote in favor of self-determination for Algeria. In March 1961, the French government announced that talks with the FLN were to take place and declared a unilateral ceasefire. This was the final straw for the rightist elements in Algeria. Under the leadership of General Charles, they decided to seize control. In April, Charles flew to Algeria, where French Foreign Legion paratroops mutinied. De Gaulle now made an emotional appeal to the French nation, one that was listened to widely on both sides of the Mediterranean. But de Gaulle's trump card proved to be the large number of conscripts in the army in Algeria. They had been growing ever more disillusioned with the war. The conscripts now frustrated the mutiny from spreading. Charles realized that all was up. He flew to Paris to surrender and was imprisoned. Other rightist leaders now went underground, forming the Organisation Armée Secrète, or OAS. Peace talks with the Muslims finally began in May 1961. The OAS now turned on the FLN, hoping to create a situation in which the army would be forced to take control. When agreement for independence was finally reached in March 1962, the OAS began to attack the army and police. Most of its leaders were, however, quickly hunted down. In the meantime, thousands of Pieds Noirs left Algeria for good. On the 4th of July 1962, Algeria finally gained her independence under Ahmed Ben Bella. The eight years' struggle had cost the lives of over 17,000 French soldiers, nearly 3,000 Pieds Noirs, and between 300,000 and 1 million Muslims. 
it was by far the bitterest of the post-1945 end of empire conflicts. Conventional wars between states have also been a major characteristic of post-1945 conflict. On the Indian subcontinent, there have been two such wars since the initial fighting after India and Pakistan gained their independence from Britain in 1947. The armed forces of both were largely equipped with British, French, American and Russian weapons. The first Indo-Pakistan war erupted in 1965 from a long-standing dispute over ownership of border areas. One was Kashmir in the north. The other was the desolate Ran of Kutch at the western end of the Indo-West Pakistan border. Amid increasing skirmishing, both sides deployed massive reinforcements and launched attacks in August 1965. On the 6th of September, the Indians widened the conflict by launching Operation Grand Slam, which threatened the important Pakistani city of Lahore. Two days later, the Indians also attacked towards Hyderabad and Sialkot. The United Nations Security Council now stepped in and fighting ceased on the 23rd of September. Pakistan was awarded the Ran of Kutch and India territory near Sialkot. Even so, tension remained high and in December 1971, war between the two countries erupted once more. This time the root cause was East Pakistan. Separated from West Pakistan by a thousand miles of Indian territory, the people of East Pakistan were of a different culture to those in the West. They increasingly resented political and economic power being concentrated in the latter, and an independence movement called the Awami League was formed. In December 1970, elections were held in both parts of Pakistan. The Awami League won an overwhelming majority in the East, but Pakistani ruler General Yahya Khan postponed the opening of parliament. Protest riots now broke out in East Pakistan. Awami League leader Sheikh Mujibur Rahman declared the independent state of Bangladesh. Yahya Khan reacted by sending in the army. The soldiers forcibly crushed the unrest. They caused thousands of deaths. A flood of refugees now crossed the Indian border into West Bengal, while in East Pakistan itself, the militant wing of the Awami League harried the Pakistan army. The Indian government, appalled by the one million refugees, now prepared to give military help to the Awami League, but had to wait until the end of the monsoon before mounting active operations. Nevertheless, Indian and Pakistani troops clashed during the autumn when the latter crossed the border in pursuit of militant bands. Apart from being a geographically split country, the Pakistanis had the added disadvantage of having a military strength which was just a third of that of India. They therefore launched preemptive airstrikes and attacked from West Pakistan in order to divert Indian attention from East Pakistan. India's Navy came into action the following day when aircraft from the carrier Vikrant, seen here taking part in a naval review, and land-based types struck at Dhaka the East Pakistan capital and other targets. 
Simultaneously, ground troops also thrust towards Dhaka. The air attacks had resulted in extensive damage to the city, but within two weeks it was surrounded and the Pakistan forces surrendered. In the west, the fighting was much less one-sided. Indian Soviet supplied T-55s clashed with Pakistani US built M47 Patton tanks. But with the Pakistani surrender taking place in East Pakistan on the 16th of December, Indian Prime Minister Indira Gandhi declared a ceasefire in the West on the following day. Thus the state of Bangladesh came into being. The eastern Mediterranean island of Cyprus was also a bone of contention. Part of the Turkish Ottoman Empire until the British took control in 1878, Cyprus had Turkish and Greek communities. During the 1950s, Greek extremists launched a terrorist campaign against the British in order to achieve enosis, union with Greece. Eventually, Cyprus was given its independence under the presidency of Archbishop Makarios. But friction between the Greek Cypriots and the Turkish minority soon grew. By 1963, the island was on the verge of civil war, as the police struggled desperately to keep the rival mobs apart. In December 1963, British troops, who still had bases on the island, were called in to keep the peace. They were replaced by United Nations troops in April 1964. But in July, Turkey finally acted. She mounted an amphibious assault on Cyprus's north coast. This was accompanied by an airborne assault. There was little that the lightly armed UN troops could do about it, and it was difficult for British forces on Cyprus to fire at a NATO ally. Three weeks, sporadic fighting saw the Turks secure the northern half of Cyprus. Thereafter, UN troops patrolled the border with the Greek Cypriot south. Amphibious operations also played a major role in the conflict between Britain and Argentina over ownership of remote islands in the South Atlantic known as the Malvinas by the latter and the Falklands by the British. Ownership of the Falklands had been disputed by Britain and Argentina since the 1830s. The growing repressiveness of General Leopoldo Galtieri's military junta, which ruled Argentina, was making it increasingly unpopular by the early 1980s. He therefore tried to divert domestic attention by recapturing the Malvinas. And on the 2nd of April, 1982, 500 Argentinian marines and special forces invaded the islands, quickly forcing the small garrison of 80 British marines to surrender. Two days later, the Argentines also seized the inhospitable island of South Georgia, 900 miles to the east. Yet on the 5th of April, a task force set sail from Britain to regain the Falklands. Three weeks later, South Georgia was back in British hands. Elderly Vulcan V-bombers flew from Britain to Ascension Island, 
where facilities had been leased from the Americans, and thence to bomb the only airfield in the Falklands, that at Port Stanley. This necessitated much mid-air refueling. On the 2nd of May, the British submarine Conqueror sank the Argentine cruiser Belgrano. Not only did this remove the Argentine surface naval threat since their fleet returned to port, but also created Royal Navy history as the first time its submarines had sent an opposing warship to the bottom since 1945. As the British task force closed on the Falklands, the battle now turned to the air. British Harriers began to battle it out with US-built A4 Skyhawks, French-built Super Etendards, and French-designed, but Israeli-built, Daggers. It was now that the Harrier's remarkable versatility was truly displayed. But the key contest was between the Argentine Air Force and the British warships. On the 4th of May, the Type 42 destroyer Sheffield was fatally struck by an Exocet anti-ship missile fired from a Super Etendard aircraft. On the 21st of May, British troops landed in the Falklands. They established a beachhead at San Carlos Bay. It was now that the air-sea battle intensified, as Argentine aircraft made repeated attacks on the ships in San Carlos water. During the next few days, Argentine aircraft sank three warships and a container ship, and might have accounted for more if their bombs had been correctly fused. But the British Rapier air defense missile system and the Harriers shot down a considerable number of aircraft. Thus the British were able to consolidate their beachhead. On the 28th of May came the first serious ground clash at Goose Green, when British paratroops, after a bitter fight, captured the settlement there. But the British too suffered casualties. Captain James, Lieutenant Barry, Corporal Hardman. Then began the march towards Port Stanley, the ultimate objective. This had to be done largely on foot over very difficult country because all but one of the heavy lift helicopters had gone down with the container ship. Before the final battles in front of Port Stanley opened, the British were to suffer one more disaster when Argentinian aircraft struck the landing ships Sir Galahad and Sir Tristram in Bluff Cove. Casualties were very heavy, but the British advance on Port Stanley continued. On the night of the 11th, 12th of June, the final phase of the campaign began with the attack on rock-strewn Mount Longdon. Two nights later came the assaults on Wireless Ridge and Mount Tumbledown. These were battles fought by infantrymen with rifle, bayonet, grenade and light machine gun. They were in marked contrast to the mechanized high-tech war that the bulk of the British Army was training for in Europe. Next day, the Argentine forces surrendered and British troops entered Port Stanley. The war brought about the downfall of Galtieri and his junta. For Britain, the conflict provided a massive boost to national pride and to the international standing of Prime Minister Thatcher. <laughs> 
The 1980s saw American forces involved in two police actions. Grenada was invaded in October 1983 at the request of the Organization of Eastern Caribbean States, who were concerned by a recent extreme leftist coup and the presence of Cubans, who were building a massive airstrip on the island. After three days, the Americans and their Caribbean allies had virtually secured the island and rescued a group of US students who had been trapped there. Then, in December 1989, US troops were in action in Panama. General Manuel Noriega, the country's strongman, had refused to acknowledge the defeat of his candidate in presidential elections held earlier in the year. The United States also suspected him of being heavily involved in drug trafficking. There was some fighting with troops loyal to Noriega. Noriega himself sought refuge in the papal nuncio's residence in Panama City. US troops surrounded this and began to subject Noriega to a bout of psychological warfare. Good morning, Panama. Eventually, Noriega surrendered and was handed over to the US Drug Enforcement Agency. Perhaps the strangest conventional war of the past 50 years was the so-called football war between Honduras and El Salvador in July 1969. It was triggered by El Salvador's defeat of the former in a World Cup qualifying match. The underlying cause was, however, Honduran resentment of migrant Salvadorian workers robbing them of jobs. Salvadorian troops invaded Honduras. It was the first time that El Salvador's army had seen action. But after two weeks fighting, the Organization of American States managed to end the hostilities. The other main form of conflict in the post-1945 era has been civil war. Nigeria was racked by this in the 1960s. The cause was essentially tribal rivalry between the northerners and the eastern Igbos. In mid-1966, General Yakubu Gawan, a northerner, seized power. In May 1967, he announced that the country was to be split into 12 regions instead of the existing four. At this, the military governor of eastern Nigeria, Colonel Odumegwu Ojukwo, declared the formation of the Igbo Republic of Biafra. In July 1967, federal troops invaded Biafra. The Biafran counter-offensive was thrown back by the stronger federal forces. Thereafter, the war degenerated into a blockade of Biafra, which caused great suffering among its people. This was aggravated by the federal capture of Biafra's only seaports in September 1968. In June 1969, the federal forces, now grown to some 180,000 men, began a slow but steady final offensive. Not until January 1970 did hostilities come to an end and Biafra was reincorporated in the Federation. Some two million of its inhabitants had died, many of them children from starvation. Congo suffered in a similar fashion after gaining its independence from Belgium in 1960. The mineral-rich southern province of Katanga broke away. Congo Prime Minister Patrice Lumumba asked for UN help to regain Katanga. 
Moshe Chombe, the Katangese leader, recruited white mercenaries to help him. Their presence was to be one of the hallmarks of conflict in Africa during the next 20 years. Bitter fighting took place as the UN forces advanced into Katanga. Eventually, the UN managed to overrun the province and it was unified with Congo once more in January 1963, but unrest continued. Increasing lack of funds forced the UN to leave the country by the end of June 1964. In July, Chombe, who had been in exile, was appointed prime minister in an effort to unite the country. Again, he employed white mercenaries to help crush the rebels. This merely added to his unpopularity in much of Africa and the communist bloc. Towards the end of November 1964, Chombe also employed Belgian paratroops, who dropped from US aircraft on Stanleyville in order to rescue 1,600 white hostages. The paratroops were, however, hurriedly withdrawn in the face of further outcries from other African and communist states. Chombi clung on to power for another year, before being ousted. Power now fell into the hands of General Sese Mobutu, the army commander-in-chief. In 1966, he had to crush another revolt by Katangese gendarmes, and it would be several years before Zaire, as Mobutu renamed the country, achieved reasonable stability. The Horn of Africa, in the northeast of the continent, saw almost endless conflict from the mid-1950s. Sudan, Somalia and Eritrea were racked by war. Repeated famines further worsened the plight of their peoples. In March 1952, a coup d'etat in the Caribbean island of Cuba brought right-wing dictator General Fulgencio Batista to power. A year later, there was a left-wing revolt led by brothers Fidel and Raul Castro. It was quickly crushed, but towards the end of 1956, the Castro brothers tried again. Increasing popular support enabled them to move out of the mountains. Such was their success that at the beginning of 1959, Batista fled the country and Fidel Castro seized power. This was mirrored in other conflicts in the region, especially in Central America. El Salvador experienced such a struggle which lasted from 1980 until January 1992. The United Nations eventually managed to engineer a peace settlement, but the conflict had cost the lives of 75,000 Salvadorians and displaced over half a million others. An equally bitter struggle took place in Nicaragua between President Anastasio Somoza and the left-wing Sandinista movement. It began in 1977. The first phase ended in July 1979 when Somoza fled to the United States, leaving the Sandinistas in charge. Concerned by Cuban and Soviet influence over Nicaragua, the Americans gave support to right-wing groups known as the Contras. These began to make sallies into Nicaragua from neighboring Honduras and Costa Rica. Finally, in February 1989, Central American states achieved agreement that the Sandinistas would allow democratic elections in return for disbandment of the Contras. To the surprise of most, it was the moderate opposition which won these in 1990. Conventional and civil wars have taken place in many other parts of the world since 1945. Indochina and the Middle East are the two other regions which have experienced endless tension and conflict 
since the end of the Second World War.